and we're live. Hi everyone, welcome to the sixth annual MIT IAP Computational Law Workshop course. My name is Tammy Rogier and I'll be one of your three TAs for this course. And I speak for myself and all the other TAs and instructors when I say that we are so excited for you to join us this year for this special workshop. We are in unprecedented times. So this year we'll be splitting the workshop over the course of four one hour long sessions. Over the course of these four weeks, we'll be providing you with a conceptual overview of computational law. And this lecture series will include everything from seminar style lectures, to classroom discussions, to supplemental readings, to key challenges posed by our invited speakers. In true MIT fashion, this course will also include an optional experiential learning opportunity, which will be through a class project that you'll hear more about later. Okay, so oops, make sure this is on the right slide. Okay, to go over some housekeeping rules. First, I just wanna reiterate that everything this year from class sessions to our activities will be virtual and available through links that will be provided to you shortly before each class. And we ask that you please reserve an hour before class each week to review the class materials in advance of the discussions that we'll have for the week. And to keep things simple, we'll be meeting at the same time every week from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Friday for the next four weeks, including this one. And I know that that was a lot of information. So if you wanna refresh any of it, as you saw, it's on the slides four and five of the slide deck for this course. And now I'd like to introduce you to your main instructors and TAs who will be here with you throughout the course of this, throughout the duration of this course, starting with Dazza Greenwood, your instructor. Thank you so much, uh, TMA. Um, hi, I, I am Dazza. Um, I'm, uh, a lecturer and a scientist at MIT in the Media Lab and also in Connection Science, which is in our School of Engineering. And um, uh, I, I basically am the, I run the computational law um, research initiatives um, primarily out of the Media Lab. And uh, this class is very much part of those initiatives. This is our more open engagement um, uh, interface. Uh, so we're, we're very focused on uh, expressing the law and legal instruments and legal processes as, as code and as um, services. And, uh, and we've got a terrific um, cast of characters for you this, this semester, some amazing speakers, um, opportunities to do projects that you'll hear more about from Brian uh, later uh, this, this uh, in the hour. And, uh, and also uh, we'll be doing some open office hours. I know from emails, many of you would like more opportunities to talk and to have discussions. So, uh, but when, uh, toward the end of the class today, we'll have uh, an opportunity for you to sign up for that as well. In the meantime, if it wasn't clear from what TMA said, I should just also mention, uh, we're gonna be using the chat uh, to pose questions um, to the speaker as they're going and, and also other general questions. And we've got, as you're about to um, learn, um, a, a, a terrific uh, cast of, um, uh, of instructors and teacher's assistants who will be monitoring the chat. So uh, please do use that to, to pose your questions or, uh, or comments. So with that, um, I'll hand it forward to our co-instructor, Brian Wilson. Hey, everybody. My name's Brian. Um, I am a fellow in the MIT Connection Science Research Group, where I serve as the editor-in-chief for the MIT Computational Law Report. And one of the kind of unique things about the Computational Law Report is we don't want it to just be a standard sort of legal publication. We want it to be a place where we can also, you know, in addition to producing content, we can also hold conversations with people in the space who are doing interesting things, and we can also convene and we also can convene and learn and do these interesting sorts of uh, kind of experimental learning um, uh, challenges like we're doing with this IAP course. So I'm really happy to be here with you all and extending that vision a little bit. And uh, I will hand it over to Andrew. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Domzowski. I'm the research editor of the MIT Computational Law Report and a practicing attorney by trade. I'm very excited to serve as a TA of this course. Uh, we have an excellent list of guest speakers. And uh, so we're looking forward to their contributions and the participation of all the students here. Uh, so the, with that, welcome, and I will hand it off to Megan. 
Hi, hi everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Megan. I am also one of the TAs. Um, I am a PhD candidate and a lecturer at Sciences Po as well. Um, and I'm so happy to see all of you here. Um, as I mentioned in this welcome video that um, I was formerly a participant of this course and it really opened my eyes and I really hope that um, with the material, with the exciting lineup that you all share that same experience that I had. So with that, I'll pass that over back to TMA. Thanks, Megan. Hi guys, I'm TMA and I'm also an advisor at the MIT Computational Law Report. My background's in finance and blockchain. And for the last several years, I've also been a part of the MIT computational law community. This is my third time TAing for the course. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here again and to be learning with you guys. So with that, I'm gonna get started with like the core part of our lecture today. Today, we're gonna be hearing from Professor David Restrepo, who is a part of the faculty at HCC Paris where he's a director of research on legal metrics and smart law, which stands for scientific mathematical, algorithmic, risk and technology driven law. Today, he'll be discussing opportunities for using computational law to audit data supply chains. And if you, like Dadza said, if you have any questions come up during his lecture, please feel free to submit them via Zoom and we're going to get to them during the Q&A section of Professor Restrepo's talk. Okay, Professor, the floor is yours. Yep, Dadza. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, you might wanna just show the slide with uh, the David's background. Yes. The oh. Wait, why is he not showing? There we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Timmy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Dessa. Um, so let me, um, so can I get a uh, kind of screen share now? Yeah, I'll stop sharing, Professor. Thank you very much. So, um, Hello everyone, very happy to see some uh, familiar faces. I hope you're, you're seeing my screen now. Um, so very glad to be, very glad to be here today and to share some thoughts after the great talk that uh, Dasa shared with us uh, at HEC a few days ago. Uh, so I thought that the first thing I would do uh, was to connect with the computational law concept. And as Timmy said, we are basically working with the smart law concept, which is actually not that far from computational or actually very similar. Um, and smart, we use smart law as an acronym, as you realize, so for scientific mathematical risk and technology driven law. Um, so it is sort of slightly different from the idea of code is law. Where there is some sort of alineation of law to code. Uh, and actually, um, it is closer to computational law in some sense. We see computational law so for some, somehow as a starting point and probably the core of the uh, smart law understanding. Um, but it adds some others, other concepts that I'm going to try to show you right now. Uh, and because the sort of main thesis is that there is some sort of hybridization of law in the process, right? Uh, so it is not that we have sort of a computational application for law, but that actual legal rules are becoming hybrid to some extent. And that at some point, um, the uh, nature of rules uh, become partly sort of what we know as traditionally legal and partly computational. And the fact that they become hybrid entails some consequences for the way we understand law, which basically are related to the uh, risk aspects. Uh, and the mathematics and the, the scientific part are sort of support elements. So let me give you an example. You, there is a, an article that we have, I have written with Gregory Lekovich on, on this uh, and that you can actually have a look at. I think Megan helped on that article. So uh, it, was, it was really great to have Megan also with us. Um, so let me give you a very simple example how we're, where you can see this. Uh, a good example is the cycle of financial law today. And financial law has a, an interesting element is that in fa finance is one of the areas where there is more innovation in business. Um, and uh, what happened in, in, in finance is that in the FinTech, different uh, actors started using a computer programs. This is usually what we know as FinTech computer programs to support or enable banking application. Um, as a consequence of the use of these uh, technologies, um, some obligations were put into uh, corporations or banking or banks uh, to implement regulation. 
And this is where we shifted towards uh, reg tech. So different sort of uh, startups and companies are starting developing tools. I'm gonna show this in, in a more concrete example. Uh, it started developing tools uh, to ensure that uh, in the use of technology by the banking and financial services, uh, legal rules were being respected. So we sort of shifted towards the computational aspect, right, of, of, um, of the law. Um, the thing is that in order for uh, financial supervisors to be able now to monitor the activities of uh, banks and financial services, implementing technology and implementing technology to implement legal rules, they also needed to carry out this process through technology. So what you have is a loop, what we call FinTech, RegTech, SubTech, where the entire cycle of financial regulation goes through technology. Uh, uh, it, 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 there is just a very recent paper by the European Securities and Market Authority, December 2020, is so a very recent, on algorithmic trading. And what is interesting here, you see very well the relationship is that in different regulations in the European Union, which are basically the market abuse regulation and the MIFID II, um, which is a directive, um, there is an obligation uh, overall, there is an obligation for uh, actors operating in a trading venue and to um, um, investors uh, or um, any person professionally carrying an activity in a trading venue to ensure that their uh, algorithms, the algorithms that are deployed in the trading venue uh, are actually will not cause any uh, disordered trading or will not uh, behave badly under stress conditions, right? Um, so this is an obligation, as you see in the different uh, articles that I'm citing, that are basically in many cases on the burden of the um, uh, person engaging in the, um, in the, in the, in the trading venue. And um, when you see Article 17, so on the right hand on the bottom, you see that an investment firm that engages in algorithmic trading uh, should have in place effective systems in control. Uh, and these include, on top, uh, ensuring that the algorithms have been tested. Okay, so how this is actually performed, what you have here, very simple, is a fintech, regtech, subtech uh, context. On top, there's a very, very famous case of, uh, um, of um, a spoofing uh, and in high frequency trading where algorithms were used to buy and sell in very short time um, uh, shares. Uh, I think these were some sort of derivatives. So basically what you had as a consequence of this regulation is a startup, uh, or many others actually developed. This one specifically was called AlgoGuard, who was actually certifying this is a private company certifying the algorithms that companies were using to deploy in the stock market. And in turn, the regulator, actually this is NASDAQ that you might be familiar with, NASDAQ services for regulators, have developed services to verify the algorithms that are certifying the algorithms that are actually being deployed in the trading venue, right? So what you have is a whole cycle of regulation totally performed through algorithms. So this is, uh, and, and what, of course, how this is organized is very much on sort of a risk approach. Uh, and that's why this was an example and sort of mathematical models that go behind. So this was just to show sort of the additional legs that we have put to the computational, but are of course totally included in the computational aspect. Um, and this brings me to a small anecdote before going into the core. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, what I'm showing right now. Uh, this is a story of the accountant. Um, and, and why I'm doing that is because, of course, we are at an MIT course. And at the very bottom of, the, um, of my list, I have lawyers and computer scientists. Um, and this story, if for those who are not familiar, this was a huge controversy uh, between um, the um, abacus that were used in the abacus that you have on the right and the algorithm. Uh, that we're using numbers. So um, this happened, uh, the, you know, the start of using algebra and, 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 and numbers, uh, Arab numbers started in the eighth century in Europe, uh, coming from, of course, um, uh, from um, Northern Africa. And, um, and then um, in the 13th century, uh, accountants were actually a protected profession. I don't know if this sounds familiar to lawyers, but they were a protected profession. And this protected profession had the monopoly of accountancy. 
and the tool they were using for accountancy was an abacus. Uh, and these other guys arrived saying, well, you know what, we can do the same thing with numbers and algebra uh, and, and, and some equations. And what happened was that um, in, in many states, including, for instance, in Florence, 14th century, the use of um, um, numbers were, was forbidden for accountancy. Accountancy was a protected profession. And the uh, accountants had to transport all their material in the kingdom to be able to do the accounting whether they were a market or to keep the accountants of the merchants or the king. So they had an equipment in horses transporting these throughout the kingdom. And then these other guys could do that just with some paper. Um, and, and of course they were accused of using some sort of magic and, and being able to cheat by using the numbers and all that. So what I wanted to show in, this is one example with the accountants, I didn't want to use this with lawyers, but you have a history of lawyers interacting with uh, other disciplines, with theologians, of course, with economists, engineers, managers, and today with computer scientists. Now, the story says that, um, as you might know, or I hope you do, I hope you don't go to an accountant that uses an abacus today. You, most of you might use an accountant that uses numbers. Um, so the story says basically that most of the accountants at the time became algorists. Uh, and uh, well, it, I'm not saying that all of you have to become or lawyers have to become computer scientists, but just the path that we were in other disciplines going through similar interactions before. So this having been said, um, let, me, um, let me say some of the implications of this, and maybe I'm just gonna focus on one, is that um, in some of these systems, like it happens, like I, show, I just showed in the financial cycle, you have some interesting changes that are happening. Um, and, and one of them, I just put some of there for you, is the fact that we are moving towards a system where um, we are kind of heading towards 100% compliance. I don't know if this is something we want, but this is what is happening, for instance, in the FinTech cycle, where you have the entire system being actually recorded and ensuring compliance 100%. And, uh, and this is interesting because back in, 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 in the days, um, uh, Roscoe Pound said that the life of the law lies on its enforcement. And we, it seems that sort of these uh, shift towards some sort of computational dimension at least have to get us thinking about whether the system that is 100% compliant is something we want. Uh, but it seems that it's something that could be possible to some extent. Um, now, uh, the last uh, preliminary remark is that this is shifting us. Uh, this is just, uh, I'm, I'm glad I got this first session because I'm able to, um, I, I, I can just sort of bring these sort of crazy ideas together for all of you, is that uh, we sort of see a change in the fact that we are having a course on computational law or law with the MIT and, and, and me from HEC Paris, both of us not having a law school, um, shows something here is that we, it looks like these elements reflect a shift also of the legal science from sort of field science and empirical science, would Aristotle would call it, to a lab science. And a lab science in which we sort of uh, check and program and, 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 and change parameters of algorithms uh, to do regulation rather than you know, regulating the physical world. So it's sort of a shift towards a lab science, which is very compatible with exactly this course we are seeing today. What you have on the top of the right, and now I'm moving to the content of uh, top of the right, it's one of the work we have been doing it at HEC Paris, uh, Adas is familiar with it, which is identifying networks of lawyers. How do you choose a lawyer for your case? And here, what, what I'm showing is some of the work we've been doing, identifying networks of lawyers. You have these, uh, of course, with several legal analytics. Um, and what you have is here, the dots, red or green, uh, red or yellow, represents the net win or loss rate of these lawyers. So if there is a red dot, it means the lawyer has won more, lost more cases than won. If you have a yellow one, has won more cases than lost. And then the, the, the width of the line represents the amount of common cases. Now, this is some stuff that has become a commonplace in, 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 in many researchers. And one of the things I wanted to highlight to you, because many of you come maybe from a common law background, is that there is different techniques uh, to identify different issues. And one of the things we've focused recently is on how difficult a court case is. Okay, 
And, and, and for that, we implemented different methods and we came up with a very sort of basic one, um, but this is just the execution, which was um, um, clustering cases by the common articles cited, like legal articles cited in the decision, just very basic. And we started doing that where um, basically with the number of cases um, and, and, and where we have five articles in common, four articles in common, no, five articles in common, sorry, you see it below 5K ages. Uh, actually, these uh, cases represented groups of cases relating to the same issue. So you see here on top of B on green were holidays not given by the train company and B in red related to Airbnb renting. And we thought, can this tell us something about how difficult a case is? And we started looking at, for instance, if you see the green community app with the green dots, those are green dots means that claimant won. So it seems that in this sort of cases, claim, it was an easy case for claimant. I mean, of course, we haven't read a single case. This was all done automatically. <laughs> so we haven't read a single one, but it seems like these were all easy cases for claimant and these other ones were easy cases for um, uh, uh, difficult cases for claimant. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. We're also working on the automation of the cycle of the uh, uh, Supreme Court in France, uh, sort of attributing this directly to a chamber uh, working in collaboration with the Cour de Cassation, which is the Supreme Court on our case, but I'm gonna just jump this to go to the, to the framing of our problem. So here is the question, data supply chain. This is uh, the problem statement. So um, in most of uh, the literature and discussions, even in practice about data supply chain, um, there is a lot of focus on the B2C relationship, business to consumer relationship, right? How the business or the data processor collecting the data is actually using the data and whether it is in compliance with privacy regulations. Now, in our research, the research we've, we've been conducting, we realized that actually there is something that we decided to call the data supply chain. Um, and then this term has started to gain some traction, uh, which is how the data flows in the back end of the processor. So if you think about, I don't know, um, Walmart collecting data from their consumers, actually it is very likely that Walmart is not doing much of the work. Walmart is probably transferring this data to, I don't know, Microsoft or some other teams doing business intelligence. And these teams in themselves are transferring this data to other companies. So the question is, how can we ensure that the uh, data protection regulation is being sort of respected throughout the chain. That was sort of, that's the problem statement, right? Knowing that, uh, for instance, for Walmart, it would be very difficult to get to know what a company is doing in, in Europe or in India or in Brazil uh, with the data they have transferred to them. Um, and our starting point was uh, Article 28 of the D European General Data Protection Regulation, which establishes that uh, basically the data processor, the first data processor, Walmart, is responsible for ensuring data protection in, let's call it, the supply chain. So we started working from there, right? That was our problem. I told you that there is a whole chain. Uh, so when you collect data, you might have a subcontractor that is storing the data, other subcontractor that is doing the business analytics, other that, that are doing visualization, AI. And, and in, in turn, one of your subcontractors may have subcontractors. So you have chains of not only of contracts, but you have chains of through which the data flows. Okay, so you have at the same time documents and data flowing. Um, and we are sort of um, um, start looking at the types of documents and tools that are used in the data supply chain, which are in most cases common to chains of contracts, which we are familiar with. And we have contract reviewing technologies for that increasingly. And some of the things we realized is first of all, that there is a heterogeneity of contractual artifacts. There's a lot of different documents that you have on your left. These are legal documents that are used. We have different formats and we have different ways of follow-up execution, sort of giving orders or cascading instructions, right? So this is the whole sort of type of uh, devices that are used throughout the entire cycle. Um, the other element that was important for us to, to look at was that uh, supply chains are increasing trans increasingly transnational. 
they are not like only in the US or in Europe, right? So you might have a, a, someone doing AI that is in, in Brazil or in Argentina or in Morocco while you, and this company itself might transfer the data to a different place. So uh, ensuring the um, compliance in the data supply chain is somehow enforcing some sort of global standard through a chain, right? Um, and, and this is increasingly important. We know the supply chain issues in other industries. Uh, we had that with uh, goods like garment or cars or and the whole supply chain control has uh, been a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of work in supply chain in general. Now, the question turns now to how to do it in, in, in data supply chain where there is increasing, um, increasing um, amount of data flowing. And some of the challenges more at the contract management level that we found, for instance, is centralization of data, right? Uh, just to give you an example, imagine that you have um, in the original contract between the consumer and, and, and Walmart, let's say, let's say, says that um, the data has to be stored for, will be deleted after two years, okay? Then Walmart transfers this data to Microsoft. Then Microsoft to another company. You have five or six or seven companies that have been using this data, right? How do you actually ensure that this data has, it will be deleted after two years in all these companies, right? And, and, and this is some of the things that the problem is that sometimes the data is not centralized. The storage is not centralized. So you need to make sure it is deleted in every place where it has been stored. Um, so we came down to three main pillars of compliance in chains of contracts or in the data supply chain. First, there is the coherence through contracts, meaning if the first contract says that uh, the data has to be stored for two years, you need to make sure that the other contract down the supply chain also says that the data has to be deleted after two years. So this is ensuring some sort of coherence in the contract through the supply chain. Now, the second element of compliance in the supply chain is to ensure that the documents or the contractual documents, legal documents are in compliance with the regulation, with regulation where the main processor is and probably also necessary that they are in compliance with the national regulation where the data is being processed. And the third element of compliance is actually the effective verification of the obligation, meaning that the data is effectively deleted after two years, right? So this is the auditing and verification that with the actual data. So uh, we have reviewed, I'm not gonna go into this because of course it will be too long, but we have reviewed the different technologies that exist in a paper uh, that is available in, um, in, on the internet. Um, and Basically, we've come with this. I'm just going to give you the overview to, fin to finalize the talk, the overview of the sort of technologies we've been exploring. So coherence through chain of contracts. We've been working here with the smart contracts. And our main topic here has been, first of all, to identify what can and cannot be converted into smart contracts. So when you go and look at these different documents, there are clauses that are very difficult at this stage to be translated into smart contracts. Um, to choose a specification language, uh, we have been working with a Symboleo with some of our colleagues at uh, the University of Ottawa that have developed a Symboleo as a specification language for smart contracts. Probably in our review of smart uh, of languages uh, for specific specification languages is one of the best we've found, found so far. Um, so what we've done uh, on, on this level is to try to formalize the contracts into start smart contracts using Symboleo, okay? Uh, uh, in order to be able to verify, for instance, that all the contracts through the chain include a six month or a two year period for a deletion of data. Now, these works in principle fine. If we manage to do that, we have faced different difficulties in the formalization. Let's say it works fine. The problem is that some of these companies have already thousands, if not millions of existing documents already. Um, and no one will sit down to sort of try contracts, right, from the, the natural language into smart contracts. So we are also uh, have a, a research line on using NLP to retrieve the information from the existing contracts and populate 
the um, uh, ontology, populate the uh, smart contracts categories or ontology that we have developed through the formalization process. So this is the first part we've been, um, you, you're gonna have access to the PowerPoint, so you're gonna be able to see that what kind of elements we've been uh, uh, formalizing. The second element is compliance uh, uh, assessment with regulations. And here we are working on two different levels. Uh, we started working with some of the existing databases, uh, uh, um, uh, OPP for instance, um, and we started very interesting, we started using mostly US actually, <laughs> Uh, so we are in Europe and, and we should have been using GDPR, but we started using some of existing US uh, uh, data sets for this, which were available um, to identify what is sort of a high level category of a data processing activity. Okay, so what kind of data processing activity is this, for instance, first party collection or data retention, data storage. Uh, so as a general category. Um, and for that, we've been uh, doing that uh, through uh, machine learning. I'm gonna show in a few minutes, but I'm not sure I have the time to go into the detail, but we've been uh, retraining this uh, and then uh, formalizing uh, the rules of GDPR to verify compliance of those passages in the documents with GDPR. Now, the, uh, again, the first level is to identify what is the paragraph about or what is the section about, what type of data uh, processing activity it relates to. Um, and, and then we have been matching, if you see on the right hand side, uh, because again, the data set we use to uh, train our algorithms is not GDPR. We started matching sort of the data practices categories that were identified by the usable privacy policy project with our articles. So we can match them at the verification stage. Last point. Uh, so uh, I guess to get into the time, I think I'm kind of fi almost fine. Um, Auditing oh, and Ed, uh, Ed, just since you brought it up a couple of times, we do, we definitely have time and the questions that we're tracking okay. are trending very, pe some people are very interested in the GDPR part. So uh, okay. feel free to, to um, go at your natural speed. Okay, perfect. I, I was, I was about to finish here, but then I'm going to get back to these uh, just for a second. So what was the challenge here is that the, um, there is an annotated corpus of privacy policies on which we trained our algorithms. Now, these privacy policies recognize uh, some data practices that you have on, on, on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side as well. First-party data collection, third-party data collection, data security, user access. And these um, data practices um, are further specified in, with attributes. Now, the challenge we had is that there is almost no uh, available data set to train these algorithms, to train uh, our algorithms on this data. And this that is available is actually, um, it, it annotates privacy policies in the prior to GDPR. So it's basically, if you take this, it's all non-compliant with GDPR. So our challenge was to uh, match, if you want, the data practices and attributes with GDPR articles uh, in order to be able to use uh, this matching when we would be doing uh, the uh, verification. Um, um, I can't, um, I can do that maybe in the questions, but we do, I, I could provide you with a, with a we have a, already a, um, a software doing this, it's not commercialized, but we have, it's a sort of research software that does in part this verification. Um, now, the last stage is the auditing and verification of effective compliance. So this is, this is, the, um, this is the treasure, right? This is, has the company actually deleted the data? Because you know, lawyers in many cases are interested in, for instance, whether there is, uh, if there is already a breach in the contract, whether the document is already contrary to a previous agreement, okay? It's one thing. But the other question is, or let's put it like that with an example. Let's say that the first contract says you can keep the data for two years and some contract down in the chain says that the company storing the data will uh, store the data for three years, which is already contradictory to the first agreement, right? So there's already a problem there. Now, the question that comes next is, has the company deleted the data after two years or three years? Because it's, if it is after or before two years, well, there is not actual violation, right? The data was indeed deleted within the time period that was initially established. Um, and here, uh, which is, is the greatest part, we have 
not work yet. <laughs> uh, we have not worked yet uh, because actually there is a whole set of re recent papers uh, and solutions that are being explored, one more difficult than the other. Uh, so what are, we have been doing is actually doing the literature review of this. Um, but I can tell you already how we plan to work here to have an idea. So basically um, there are different protocols, most of them using blockchain. These are the, 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 the five papers that are sort of key in, in some, there are others, but that we have been key for our literature review. And basically the idea comes as how do you generate, right? How do you generate a um, notification? How do you include a notification in the smart contract to say that the data has been deleted, okay? So you can have, of course, um, a, a, or, 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 the, or the data has been collected. So one of the first ideas we have is of course to use IOT for elements that are, can be verified through IOT, but others are a bit more difficult and we need some software, additional software development. So the fact that uh, for instance, we need to verify the deletion of the data, uh, you might, we might need some logs or we need, we, we need some techniques to verify that data has been deleted in the database. But then again, you need to make sure that you have access to all the databases or that you can verify in all the databases uh, that where the data was stored. And that's where some of the blockchain technologies that are being used now to trace data as it flows, it's interesting. Um, now, the other possibility is just to have manual entries, uh, such as to say the data has someone very, someone confirms the data has been deleted. But of course, it doesn't mean the data has been deleted. And once, but let's say that someone manually says the data has been deleted, through the smart contract technology, we can go all the way up the chain to the first consumer and business to let them know that everyone in the chain, or at least someone in the chain, has deleted the data. So you still have this sort of challenge of automating this process. But the advantage of the smart contract is that it could allow it, um, sort of the instant update through the contractual chain that the obligation has been fulfilled. So that's uh, very much what I have to share with you. Of course, I'm happy to go more into the detail of the different elements. And I'm not, of course, alone in this, uh, as uh, it would be impossible for anyone to work on these different things alone. Um, so there's a great team. I think some of them are connected uh, and, and some of the external collaborations we've had um, most of our team is composed of, of lawyers and data scientists that work together. Um, so thank you very much again. Thank you uh, for the invitation and I'm, I'm happy to answer to some questions. Outstanding. Thank you so much, uh, David. That was, that was tremendous. And uh, we have um, elicited a number of very good questions um, and uh, and uh, we have added some of them that seemed common or particularly on point to uh, one of the speaker slides. And so, uh, Tiame, if you don't mind screen sharing again and uh, advancing to the questions. Yeah, slide. no problem. Um, and then if you could perhaps uh, retake the gavel at that point uh, as our Toastmaster and and pose and just pose the questions to David so that um, so that he can just sit back and enjoy the show. You got it. Okay, it's not in the notes. Maybe I'll just. Know this I have a question a here. I everyone. have a question here that I'm reading, and I'm happy to start with that one if that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Go go right ahead. Okay, so there's a question about the open nature of rules. Uh, and of course, I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges, um, one of the biggest challenges we have. And, um, and that's why, uh, let's say from a more theoretical perspective, we, I really think that the, one of the issues is the hybridization of rules. So we have to take the hy hybridization of rules seriously, um, rather than sort of think that when we are implementing, for instance, a smart contract, we are translating a contract from natural language into code. I totally disagree with that. I don't think that's true. I think we are just somehow rewriting the contract and to some extent you can see it like that. Um, there are some people that argue that you have like, that you can see it as a contract stack to use sort of an engineering word. Uh, is like a stack of different documents including the smart contract. 
Um, but just to give a simple example, some experience I have my own, uh, when you want to do something like um, the reasonable standard of uh, a reasonable person, right? And, and I like to give a very basic example with that that, it, that hope, hopefully makes things clear is that you rent your house to someone um, and you say that the person has to take care of um, the house or the apartment uh, the reasonable person would do. Let's imagine all this is coded and in smart contracts and connected uh, IoT and stuff. So basically um, your garden, um, you, the contract foresees that you have to, to take care of your garden as a reasonable person. Let's imagine this means watering the garden twice a week. Or I, we don't even know what does, re, what does take care of the garden in a reasonable manner means. But when you're going to code these, you cannot put it in a reasonable manner. You have to sort of change reasonable into frequency. So you have to say, for instance, that um, you have to water the garden twice a week if it doesn't rain. That's what the code says. And this is not the same thing as reasonable, but there is no way of coding reasonable. I mean, you could do this in a more complex manner, but in other ways you are going from a standard, the standard of reasonableness to a rule. And that's a definite legal change because these are two different artifacts in law. So may I ask uh, David, uh, yeah. following up on that? Um, so one of the approaches we take in the media lab to artificial intelligence, for example, is a, we, we like to focus on what we call extended cognition. So uh, not so much replacing people with software and, and human processes with software completely, but augmenting what people are doing. And the way we're trying to interpret that or at least explore it in the computational law context might be at certain key junctures to invoke a human decision point, for example, like uh, to ask uh, whether the parties agree on whether something is or isn't reasonable, or to, if necessary, go to arbitration or mm -hmm. some other decision body. And all that, of course, could, in theory, be set up in an objective way where you trigger a request for a response and some parameters, you get back an answer, and you continue executing the code. But the judgment, the human judgment, perhaps, for whether something is or isn't reasonable could still uh, be situated with people. Um, would that be one potential design pattern to address this? Yeah, so definitely, definitely that's and that's what we think from the design perspective. And I, I, I can only but agree with you if we have the chance to start from the design perspective. The, the issue is that in many cases, we have already systems in place, like the high frequency trading that has to implement uh, a definition on spoofing, which was initially defined for a person or market manipulation, right? Market manipulation, it requires the intention, for instance. And, 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 and once you need to change these into an automated system, verification of algorithms performing certain uh, uh, exchanges of, of, of uh, stocks, for instance, um, it is very difficult, uh, or it's, it's not very difficult, but I mean, it depends the speed at which you are doing it. But uh, I, I guess you can have nowadays more than 15 transactions of buy and sell in a second uh, for uh, high frequency trading. So the question is how much human judgment you can include there. Uh, uh, so again, I mean, so I, I agree, but that's why the finance example is a bit probably dystopian to some extent for probably the extreme, but of course, for the gardening example, we can totally look at from the, at the design level that the ideal thing would be to do something like we just mentioned sort of from the augmented perspective. Indeed. So we, I, I see that we're, we've only got about a little under 15 minutes left, but we have so many questions. We want to see if we could squeeze one more in. Um, TMA, uh, do, would you do the honors? Yeah, let's, let's go with Gareth's question. So Gareth asked you, David, whether you differentiate data and documents as a pragmatic matter or like more as like an artificial differentiation. Data and documents? Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, that's such a difficult question, actually. <laughs> um, so it, I would say it depends for what, because I am a pragmatist. So I, I, for me, the interest of a concept is related to its use. Um, so let's say uh, documents are, for instance, data when we are going to use it for a um, for a um, for training an algorithm, right? So they, they are part of the, let's say unstructured data. 
But when I probably in the context I was using it, what I meant is that there are documents which are mostly contracts governing the relationship between two persons. And then there is the data related to the contract. Let's say the data that has been collected of your consumer behavior. And usually the contract is governing the data or the transfer of data from one company to the other. So what I mean is there is some need, what I meant probably is that the differentiation was just meant from the classic textual analysis between contracts, let's say, or documents and the actual flow and what's happening with the data. That's sort of the way I'm using it. I hope that was a, an answer for the question uh, that, that was posed. Well, it's a good start, um, and and that's completely appropriate for the first session of of our class. And, and I, for whatever it's worth, I completely agree with you. It's a deceptively simple question uh, that, when you pull on that string, it raises all <laughs> kinds of fundamental issues. So, David, I just want to, on behalf of the the whole team here, and I, I think I speak for the participants as well. Thank you so much for that presentation and for taking the time and engaging with some of the questions. Uh, as well. Uh, we have many more questions than we had time for at this point. Um, and so, um, you know, perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll make those available to you so that if you, sure. if you were able to, uh, pr you know, shed any more light, uh, I'm sure we'd welcome it, but no pressure. Thank you, Dessa. Thanks again for the invitation and to everyone. I'm happy to follow up on questions and, and, and comments with everyone. And again, I mentioned we had some already developments in software that I didn't share because I guess that time was limited, but very happy to follow up on these as well with everyone. So thanks again for the invitation and your questions. Outstanding, thank, thank you. you. Thank um, you. Okay, so okay. yeah, Tammy, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, you, you've got the gavel. Okay, I was gonna say, now we have some time for Brian to go over supplemental readings in the group project, which I think will be an exciting thing for everyone to participate in. And actually, I'll, I'll do the readings and then pass it to Brian for the okay. project. Um, so these are readings that we um, suggest that you do uh, and, um, and think about. Uh, and we are going to be offering office hours for discussion. Um, we think that these readings are going to um, catalyze a lot of questions and we, we hope some interesting ideas. Uh, and uh, I'll just say right now, we will follow up with an email with a Zoom link for those of you who are able to, um, to participate, but the, we're, we're planning to have the office hours uh, this coming Tuesday, January 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, and we'll block out an hour of time for that, and, um, we'll, and you'll be off mute, so we'll be um, having an opportunity to actually, actually talk. Um, one quick note on the, these readings is, uh, well, the first one we think is seminal from Sandy Pentland. Um, the second and third, you may notice the names um, are also teacher's assistants and, uh, or excuse me, the second and third both come from people what, when they were students in the class. It was, this was, uh, this began with their student projects. And so when Brian tells you about student projects, um, you may think about doing a paper or or the pitch or the other opportunities. And who knows, uh, it may end up becoming publishable and may even become part of a curriculum one day. Um, and uh, uh, that last one by um, Gabby on democratizing the law with open data, I, I have to say is, I understand it's somewhat U US centric, but nonetheless, I really commend uh, everyone to at least glance that it will help set some of the foundation for understanding what we even mean by the law as data and, and, and what those workflows look like uh, from a pr more practical uh, perspective. Okay, so with that, I, I'd like to hand the gavel to Brian, who is going to um, tell you about optional projects that you can do. All right, so if anybody is interested in doing a course project, uh, you know, we heavily encourage that. Um, we're coming at this from, you know, kind of this foundational standpoint that law has always been an algorithm, and I think David's presentation did a really good job of highlighting the different ways that this has developed historically um, through the convergence of law and other disciplines. And so I think that was a, a really key point that can kind of serve as the foundation for how, how to think about projects as we move throughout the rest of this course. 
And in true MIT fashion, we're really focused on building and creating as a means to explore these kind of unique tensions between law, data, computation, and design. Um, so to that end, we're offering students and participants in this course the opportunity to present either a paper, a project, or a prototype. And to start out, we've come up with this Google form that will be available to everybody to kind of sign up to. And we'll use that as a way to communicate with you so that we can help guide you in the direction that you want to go with creating something, hopefully with the end goal being something that is you know, either publishable, something that creates a business venture, or something that you can actually demonstrate and prototype. Um, so obviously to participate, just sign up for the Google form and we'll follow up with more information. And then we'll include instructions later on about how to use GitHub as a means to submit your projects to this course so that this legacy kind of endures far beyond just this four weeks and really lasts into the, uh, into the coming uh, months and years. Because we think you know, the, the insights here are going to be ones that are truly groundbreaking and uh, can really serve as a great uh, sort of reference point for people who are interested in this sort of work in the future. So I'd encourage everybody to sign up. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to submit those to the, the Google form that we have for questions as well, and we'll be sure to get those answered. And with that, you know, I'll hand it back over to TMA and she can kind of um, tie this all up and get us, uh, get us ready to go. Thanks, oh. Brian. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm noticing that um, a lot of you in the chat want to create a sort of Telegram group. So Courtney, if you want to send me the link at the end of this class, we're going to be sending an email with um, David's presentation and other resources. So maybe we can include that in the email as well so everyone can access it. Oh, um, if it's a class link, I should just say we, we need, if it's a Telegram or something like that, we, we've had them generated by other people in the past and it frequently doesn't end well when they, it can be difficult to administer or maybe they okay. lose their account. So if people want a Telegram group, we can do a Telegram group. We've done it in years past. We'll um, send you a link to, uh, to go to come into the Telegram group and we can do that very quickly. So um, whoever suggested that, good, good suggestion. Uh, and if you've created one already, uh, please just delete it so we don't have like, you know, multiple Telegram groups, uh, which is another thing that we've experienced in the past and that doesn't go well either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you advance the slide, please? Great. There we go. Okay, so yeah, we'll include our Telegram group in the email that you guys will all get um, after this class. So thanks again, David, for your amazing presentation. And this concludes our very first lecture for this year's MIT Computational Law course. Thank you guys so much for being such wonderful students. And if you have any questions come up before our next class, there's a form that we've linked on, I believe slide 11. Can you just double check, Brian, if that's there? Yeah. Oh, no, that's the project slide. So we'll also include a slide to the question form as well. This way you guys can submit any questions and we'll get back to you before next class. So thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week. Hi. Okay, bye. We, we've got four minutes uh, as oh. well. So uh, if, do, could I just ask, could you please advance the slide to the next steps? Okay, so just to just to be explicit about it, um, read the readings. Office hours Tuesday the twelfth at one p.m. We'll send an email with that, and also with the Telegram uh, group uh, sign up, and also with the link to be able to pose questions uh, ongoing. Uh, sign up for the project that Brian just told you about. Uh, it's optional, but it, if you have time and you're interested, it is a great way to learn, to actually get your hands on a project. And you'll learn GitHub along the way. Uh, David's classes in GitHub, our classes in GitHub. 
understanding how GitHub works is is one of the skill sets that's helpful for actually doing computational law. And uh, a teaser for next week, uh, we're going to be getting into standards. And so some of what we heard about today from uh, with uh, data supply chains and um, auditing them, we'll go more deeply in a couple of um, uh, con uh, domains, uh, most importantly, perhaps being supply chains. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, um, Edifac and X12 and some of the other transaction and supply chain standards and how those, how all those little transaction codes like, uh, you know, like give me a quote, um, do an invoice, um, a purchase order and acknowledgement and all of that stuff, how that all rolls into the um, trading partner agreements and can allow for um, significant auditability and also raise some of those interesting issues and questions that David, um, David um, highlighted to us. So actually, we think looking at the standards is one great way to get your, your head. It's almost the same as like reading the statute when it comes to transactions that have been expressed through code. Um, OK, so I just wanted to sort of say that out loud so to make sure that you heard it. Um, and quickly, there was one question about uh, the due dates for the projects. And you know, there doesn't have to be a due date for the projects if you want to keep working on it after class. But we would uh, like people to submit a project before the last class. And so we'll have this kind of initial form as a way to sign up and express interest. And then we'll have a subsequent form where you actually include the links to all of your final presentations as pull requests in our GitHub repository. Thanks, Brian. Okay, I guess now, if you don't mind doing it again, Tiama, you like bring it up. <laughs> now is the official end to our very first lecture. So yeah, we're excited to see all of your projects and hopefully you guys can check out Professor Restrepo's research and his amazing presentation, which I'll definitely be looking at. There are so many good diagrams. Was, yeah, anyway, okay, we'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Now. Thank bye. you.